Great, thank you. Um, I'd just like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's council meeting. Um, just for clarity, I'll be chairing the first part of the meeting in uh, Mayor Jamie's absence. He's just away with um, Minister Clark. Yes. Minister Clark at the moment, and he should be back with, um, within the next half an hour or so. So we'll proceed through the agenda as it is, and then uh, we may need to take a short break um, as we lead into um, the second part of the meeting when Mia Klein comes back. Um, I'd like to welcome um, members of the public um, that are here with us to, today and also anyone that's listening out in, um, on YouTube. And I believe that we've, we have um, Peter Gibson from Karamea uh, to talk to us for public forum today. Okay. Um, so, We'll start off with you then, Peter, thanks. Um, I understand you, um, you you know about the public forum and there's five minutes to speak to, to us about um, your topic. And then we'll have some um, a bit of question time if any councillors have any questions for you. So over to you, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank, thank you for taking the time to hear us today. Uh, I have Jonathan Cole with me today, who is the chairperson of the Caramel Reserve Subcommittee. Uh, we will also have to answer any questions that you may have. Um, we're wishing to make a submission in relation to agenda number nine on your agenda today, which relates to the Caramel Lane Camping Ground and the Bowling Club and our water supply. I know it's a matter that you've discussed before and you've made various decisions in the past. Um, the, the agenda item that you've now got, the paper that you've now got, um, we like like you um, saw it last week for the first time. Uh, so we've been most important up to this stage. Um, the current position, perhaps we should explain to start with. Um, there's a council law which was put in years ago, and the water is pumped from there after being softened along the road and, in, and into the school. The ministry constructed a treatment plant in, on the school grounds, which filters the water, UVs it, and then it is supplied to the school to the school houses and to the domain and the bowling club. The system works very, very well. And I emphasize that it works very, very well. We now have the situation where um, we have this document in front of us, which details the council's wish, I guess is the word, or option, it's probably a better word, to move the treatment plant off the school ground and onto either the domain or onto the road somewhere, probably down by the wall. Um, there's some puzzling costs associated with that proposal, which is in two phases. First of all, it's the movement of the treatment plant somewhere else off the school ground. Stage, stage two of the pool. And then stage three was to upgrade it, which we understand will need to be done eventually with promotion. Now, the decision by the, well, the recommendation, I guess, is, is the word on page 111, is that the, and I'll, I'll read what it actually says the treatment plant be relocated to a site owned, stroke, controlled by the council. I think the word control is the fact that this would ensure ongoing access and mitigate the risk to council of operating such a plant on school grounds. And the ground cited are health and safety and security. Uh, we put these questions to the school board and I'd just like to read you briefly some of their reaction. 
The treatment plant equipment and chemicals are safely and securely housed in a fully compliant structure as part of the newly upgraded swimming pool. For the care of the for the trustees. All health and safety precautions have been taken into consideration in designing and constructing the plant, housing, and chemical storage areas. Lock and secure access is by the school caretaker who lives on site. If and when BD staff require access, it is a minor matter, issue, and a key. Now, I think to a large extent, surely that addresses some of the concerns in this paper as regards access, health and safety, and security. The building is already on the school, we accept that, but they can see no problems whatsoever. We are therefore suggesting that the existing system simply be retained as it is. Until such time as chlorination is required, which we understand is coming up, we're not quite sure when, and then it can be installed in the existing building on the school grounds as already planned. When the initial installation was done a year and 18 months ago, I just want to point out a figure here now. The total cost we understand was about 120000 the papers that you've got in front of you now suggest that you're going to spend another half a million, okay, half a million, simply to provide the school, the domain, and the public club with coordinated water. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the costs are going to fall, but I. Uh, can we just suggest that you stand back perhaps, have another look at it, perhaps talk to again to the ministry and make sure that between the two of you, you can cooperate and just leave the plant where it is and simply crawl. Now, we've been told by the chlorine by the operators that that was allowed for when the Treatment plant was first installed. They knew, obviously, that chlorination was coming up. And therefore, it is probably a simple matter. And if we want to put a ballpark figure on it, perhaps 100,000 to simply upgrade the system to chlorination, fully chlorinated, fully legal, fully compliant, rather than what we are now seeing today in that paper which is suggested costs of nearly half a million. The only advantage being that the treatment plant comes off the school grounds and goes onto somewhere. The other thing we, we do want to mention also when we look at the costs is the operating costs. The operating costs to us are, well, I use the word puzzling. Let's, let's be kind. You are talking in this paper of total cost to the school and the domain of 55000 rising to 78000 per annum to supply water to a school and a domain. So, but, uh, personally, and I think that the main board agrees with me, we're, we're not only puzzled, we're alarmed at those sort of figures and our ability to be able to support the funding in whichever shape and manner or form you're going to impose. We don't know how you're going to try and recover those costs from us. We don't know how you're going to try and recover those costs from the school. So at the present moment, we would suggest please that you have another look at this paper, consider the options, consider the costs, and the Academy Reserve Subcommittee considers, please just leave it as it is. And just upgrade it into the board. Okay, um, th thank you, Peter, for coming to talk to us today. Um, I'll, any councillors with any questions? Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Thanks, uh, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, interesting. 
uh, I should have perhaps been aware of this, but it's the first time I've heard that the school supply also supplies their own houses. How many of them talk about that? Like three houses. So, school, three houses. There's no more than three. Right. And no um, the hall was the hall involved in that supply as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, the hall's part was filled. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Any further questions from councillors? No. Okay, thanks very much, um, Peter and Jonathan, for coming along. So, what will happen now is um, we'll discuss the agenda item, and at the end of um, our meeting, we'll, we'll um, talk councillors <coughs> and discuss what response we'll um, come back to you with uh, further to your submission today. Councillor Sampson. Could we bring uh, that item to my court? Uh, in the agenda. Uh, it wasn't my plan to bring it forward. Um, just a while I hear. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that a bit of thought, Councillor Sampson, uh, Councillor Hawes. I just thought we were reluctant to have that conversation without me, Jamie, present. If that's the intent, then I'll expect it to be when you ask back. Um, and, and thank you for that, <coughs> Councillor Hawes. That was. Um, my thoughts were around um, when we would have that in the agenda it would be when everyone would be present. So um, I'm going to, on that note, I'm going to keep the agenda as it is. So although I do appreciate that Councillor Sampson, I don't think it will be probably much longer than a half an hour before we will be addressing it if, if Peter and Jonathan are um, of a mind to stay on. Um, but that's that's up to you. So we'll we'll just progress with the meeting as it as it is. Um, thank you for that. Um, we also have one further, um, just in regard to the Karamea Area School. We've received a CEO Sharon has received a letter from the Karamea Area School, um, which I'm going to read now in public forum. Um, some of the points in it have been covered off by. By Peter, but I think it's important to read it as it's come from the school um, for all councillors here. So um, this is, as I say, is addressed to CEO Sharon, and this is from Tom Morton, who is the um, Karamea, oh, yeah, from the Karamea Area School Board of Trustees. So I'm writing on behalf of the Karamea Area School Board of Trustees with regard to the proposed changes to the location of the water treatment equipment on the Ministry of Education grounds used to treat water for the school as well as the bowling club and domain. The board sees no reason for the proposed relocation on the following grounds. Treatment plant equipment and chemicals are safely and securely housed in a fully compliant structure as part of our newly upgraded swimming pool infrastructure. All health and safety precautions have been taken into consideration in designing and constructing the plant housing and housing and chemical storage areas. Locked and secured access via our school caretaker who lives on site. If and when BDC staff require access, it is a minor matter to issue another key. The Ministry of Education, having invested heavily in upgrading our water supply, is happy with the current arrangement. And in the face of recent expenditure, further unnecessary, unnecessary costs will be difficult to justify. <coughs> in regards, Tom Newton. Okay, so we're just recording that as a um, in the public forum, and Tom will also get a response further to our discussions. Thank you very much. Okay, councillors. Um, now we clear the official part of the meeting open, and I'm going to. Firstly, a call for apologies. Um, as explained, Councillor um, Mayor Klein will be um, a little bit late in the meeting because he is currently with Minister Clark um, and he will hopefully be joining us sometime shortly after 3.30. Um, so the resolution is, well, oh, we haven't got any apologies. So I don't think we need a resolution. So we're all good. Members' interest. Okay, agenda item number two. If, do any councillors have any members' interest in any of the items on today's agenda? Okay.
Okay, no members' interests. I think we'll still have one <coughs> declaration resolved that members disclose any financial or non financial interest in gender items. I'll move that way. Seconded Councillor Montgomery. All in favour? Aye. Against? No. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, confirmation of the previous minutes. Um, these are the minutes of the 12th of April. And you would have seen that Gina sent through an update to Diligent um, with a few um, minor amendments. Um, I don't think there was anything that was that changed the content of it as such. So I'm, I'm assuming that you've all hopefully had an opportunity to read those and taken them as read. Um, any comments? Councillor Howard. Just one very minor um, adjustment on page 15 in italics. Um, it was actually moved at that meeting that um, 76 for the road equipment to 76 A. So in all the commentary, it's, it's correct, but just on that one line, it hasn't been corrected. It's um, italics in one F. Oh, okay, I think that's because that was referring to that particular yes, but um, I, resolution. I, I, yeah, I, for I, clarity. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, so, subject to that one amendment, and this we've got our oh, Councillor Hawes. Well, yeah, on page 15, um, Councillor Howard has actually moved the motion to remove money in and then one instructs the chief executive to present that. So, did that, and um, I guess it got removed. It yes, that, that's, referring, that's referring to the two that were yeah. removed, and then further on, it gives you the clear resolution yeah. as exactly. So, that was just to show How what got sad. removed. Yes, okay. yeah. Thank you for that question on clarity. Councillor Bowden. Um, but the ones we removed it should be seventy six A Bottle Road, not seventy six. That's what um, Councillor Howard has just pointed oh, out to us. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, that, that, I'll that, that is that is the amendment. Um, so subject to to that one amendment, um, could I have somebody please um, move that we receive and confirm the minutes of the council meeting on the 22nd of April. Um, moved Councillor Weston, seconded Councillor Rutherford. All in favour? Aye. <laughs> Any against? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, now we're moving on to agenda item number four, which is the action point list. And we have one action on it. Anything you'd like to add to that, Sharon? Uh, no, thank you, Madam Chair. It's related to, um, it'll be picked up as part of our annual plan discussions through June. Um, um, the draft recommendation is Council receive the action point list for information. Would I have someone move that way? Councillor Nair, seconded Councillor Hawes. All in favour? Aye. Any against? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Now we're moving on to agenda item number five, which is the Buller District Economic Transformation. Um, we're going to introduce next. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and just on our screen, and Councillor Nair is sorry, your back is towards. We have Nick Brunston, um, who is joining us uh, to talk through the report that is attached to this agenda item. Um, full of district five year transformation and uh, welcome Nick appreciate you coming along you can hear us okay yeah perfect thank you okay, thank you and I'll pass first over to you um, CEO Sharon to to talk to this item first thank you thank you madam chair um, so I thought it was worthy of, of bringing this report um, forward it was again following on from the recent uh, quarter economic release which again has showed that Buller continue, continues to um, forward with momentum uh, through challenging times of floods and COVID, et cetera. And um, I went back to Nick and said, hey, look, this is great now. We, we've now seen a couple of years of some, you know, really great results. Feels like the, um, 
economic indicators are really starting to turn for Buller. So can you tell me what it looks like from a five-year strategic point of view about how, how have we shifted over the last five years? Because I think there's a really important story to tell. And, um, and it was really great. Nick, Nick Catalog has provided some information. And, and I think there's a really good news story here that we should be proud of and our community should be proud of uh, as to the direction of travel that, um, that Buller is heading. And so I asked Nick to, at very short notice, and Nick, thank you very much, as to come and, and actually share the presentation, talk through you know, the, the transformation that he can see. And I'll, I will say the words, Nick used the word transformation of Buller, which was really great, as opposed to our language. Um, and so, Nick, I look forward to you um, taking us through the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just um, see my screen. Oh. Oh, he's just sharing his screen. Right. Um, so, can you see that? Is it the slides? <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yes, I mean, I think as um, as Sharon said, transformation was, was my word. Um, you know, um, it's a, it really is. Um, I think when you look at the data, particularly over that five year horizon, it's, it is it is quite apparent. So um, I'll just run through. Um, it's a fairly brief report, so it'll be um, a fairly brief presentation running through. Um, I guess what what I've seen in the data. So. Um, First, th first things first. Um, I mean, you've got to uh, come at it with a degree of context, and obviously there is a um, there's, there's a backstory to the five year transformation. Um, so you know, if we look back to the 2000s, um, employment and in, in, in across Buller District um, grew phenomenally on the back of predominantly the expansion in, in mining. There was a 41% increase in, in employment between 2002 and 2012, and that sort of gets you. Um, up to the top of the mountain, if you will, on that chart. Um, you know, mining itself quadrupled, um, you know, professional services or your engineers and geotechs doubled, construction doubled, um, and everything was all going, going well. Um, at the peak, there were 5,400 people employed and you know, nearly 20% of them directly you know, employed in, in, in mining. Um, and then obviously, I mean, you know the story of, I guess, what happened, you know, the, um, the solid energy collapse, the, the coal pro global coal prices, and then Holsom as well, which, you know, is not related to the, to the to the coal mines, but it certainly didn't help. Um, and ultimately, at that sort of at the trough at the Nadir, um, at, at total employment was sitting at you know just over four thousand in, in twenty eighteen. And you can sort of see here, it really did. Um, it sort of at its bottom, and it's you know, and it's starting to um, to grow modestly off that base. And that's sort of, I guess, the start of that story. Looking at population, it, um, you know, population came along for the ride as well. Um, population grew from 9,800 in, in 20, 2002 up to 10,600 in, in, in 2012 and then fell back to 9,600. So it actually fell back to, um, to slightly lower than where it was, um, you know, fractionally lower than where it began. And again, um, once we get to about 2018, about here, um, it's, it's still declining, but you know, the decline is really moderated compared to that sort of steepness there. Um, and it's interesting to see in exercises that we've done for um, for Westland and Grey that you know the population largely sort of came up the line and then and, and then went back down the line. And certainly for Westland's point of view, it was quite convenient because um, you know it came at the time um, as international tourism was really scaling up down there. Um, so we do have um, the, the, the population data is up to June 2021. Um, we, we will get data for June 2022 um, towards the end of this year. But we look at health enrolments in between just as a bit of an indication for what the population is doing in between those official estimates. And um, health enrolments of, of, of Buller residents are up 3.5% in the year to March 2020. So it sort of gives a reasonably positive indication that I, I think that, you know, once we get the data, we'll see that that line, um, that decline has finally stopped and it's flattened off and, and it's possibly starting to rise a little bit again. So that was sort of the, the, the historical context, if you will, which I'm sure you know, you're, you're broadly familiar with. Moving on to that sort of past five years, which I think tells the really interesting story. Um, we can see that you know, um, if we look at the past five years, um, it's taken a while for GDP growth to pick up. But um, particularly if you focus on the past two years, that sort of post-COVID period from the start of 2020 to now, um, Buller's GDP growth has outpaced the rest of the country quite substantially. The economy grew by 6.3% per annum um, for each of the past two years compared to the national of 1.9. So that's basically growing three times as fast. Um, and that reflects sort of some underlying resilience. Um, you know, you had relatively little exposure to international tourism, and that's the thing that dragged down a lot of areas, uh, losing their international tourists with the border closures. Um, but also the primary sectors being a key part of the economy. That's a part that can keep on going. You can still milk the cows under alert level four, and that does really help as well. 
Um, consumer spending is another good indicator, I guess, of that confidence in terms of how um, how households are feeling. Um, and again, um, you know, re, you know, Buller's consumer spending growth has really outpaced the rest of the country, growing by nine percent per annum over the last two years compared to one percent nationally. And again, you can see that this was starting to pick up pre-COVID, but it's just accelerated pre-COVID, um, both in its own right and as the rest of the country has become sort of weak by comparison. So we track 46 territorial authorities for this measure and Buller was the fourth highest for, um, for, for increases in consumer spending over the last two years. So again, sort of really at the top of the table. If we look at the industries that are growing again over that sort of um, that sort of COVID period, I mean it's worth noting that you know 14 out of these 19 industries which we use to sort of segment the economy, 14 out of the 19 um, have grown. Um, you know, most notably health and manufacturing, adding sort of around about 55 jobs each. Um, and then sort of notable increases in construction and wholesale trade as well. Um, if we look at the ones that are declined, accommodation and food services, well, that's partly a tourism story. Again, you know, we have had domestic tourists, and I'll touch on that a bit more um, later. Um, but domestic tourists don't buy quite the same things as, as international tourists do. So you do face a little bit of lower demand for some things there, um, especially accommodation and sort of restaurant food and the like. Um, you will note that agriculture is on the decline list. Um, this may actually just be from a lack of workers. We've seen this in quite a few areas. Um, there is still the activity happening on the farm, but they just can't get the workers with the with migrant workers heading home and a, and a lack of um, working holiday visa um, visa holders as well. So that's um, that's not reflect, not necessarily reflecting a lack of work to be done, if you will. Um, moving on to the housing market, I've skipped house prices because I think they, um, that one's a fairly relative, um, it depends on your viewpoint as a buyer or a seller, whether it's good or bad, but um, house sales, I think, is a quite a positive story. If we go back to sort of 2014, 15, the market was, was pretty grim. House sales are way down. It was taking sort of over 200 days on average to sell a house in the district, and now we can see that there's a lot more liquidity in the market, which is really great for people to be able to move around and, and do what they want to do. Um, Sales rose um, rose to 209 um, houses sold in the year to March 2022, um, which was the fourth highest increase out of all 66 um, territorial authorities. Um, I think we can see um, it has come back a little bit. Um, I suspect most of that's sort of a factor driven by the floods um, back in June last year. Um, we saw the same in Christchurch. You know, if, if you're about to have your house fixed by the insurance company, it's not a great time to sell. And so you do see stuff comes off the market just while people sort of... Um, I guess, sort their house out um, literally um, and, then, and then bring it back onto market if they do want it. On building consents, so this is, again, was um, I think we're quite, rising quite sharply out of COVID. Um, I suspect while that's been, um, you know, the sort of sudden shift in acceptance around remote working, um, in particular in, sort of in corporates, and that's um, given a bit of renewed thought to people moving into the regions, and that's just, um, added, you know, really added a bit of strength there. So we can see that the um, number of new dwellings consented in Bull has risen from around seven per quarter um, back in 2018 to 24 per quarter in, in, in 2022. So that's, um, again, um, a pretty strong indicator in confidence because it's sort of, it's one thing to buy a house, but it's another thing to sort of invest in an area and, um, and choose to build new. Similar story for building consents, for not for non-residential consents rather. These are a little bit more lumpy. We have sort of a few big projects that sort of skew things a bit. So we've got um, a $12 million consent for the Buller Health Centre, partly driving this up, but you know, we're, we're up at, um, at sort of 30 mil, over 30, 35 million for the year to March 2022. So it's, you know, that, that's not, not, not the whole story. Um, and again, that is a bit of a business confidence measure to invest in a new, uh, new um, warehouse or office is a, um, does reflect sort of a, a, a good a solid outlook um, for that location. Um, so final slide, um, touching on tourism expenditure. I mean, I think there's, a, um, there's actually some pretty heroic growth going on um, pre-COVID um, in, in Bola, particularly growing both domestic and international tourism. I think um, part of that comes on the back of a lot of PGF um, funding into the area. Um, you know, into, into sort of basic, um, I guess, tourism infrastructure. And I think also the Old Ghost Road, um, that was sort of 2016, I believe, that opens. That's sort of, um, that's st still fairly fresh at that point. And so it's um, just the depth of your tourism offering was expanding and it was um, able, able to capitalise on that. Um, the performance sort of through the COVID period has been pretty um, pretty remarkable. So if we look at um, uh, look at the, the 2018, there was um, 13 million um, in expenditure. Um, in total in the district by, by, by tourists, um, and that's risen up to 36 million um, in 2019, um, and then up, up even further to over 40 million 
And, um, and so this, what, this sort of orange bit here, we can see the, the jump in, in domestic spend. Um, that happened all around the country. I mean, we know that the borders are shut, so you know, Kiwis were sort of forced to finally actually explore their own backyard and, and not keep putting it off. Um, but sort of more impressively is that you've managed to keep growing your domestic spending even in the past year, which, um, which for many areas, um, they sort of faced a one-time hit. You know, people saw, saw the glaciers for the first time in 2020 and then they weren't going to come back the next year. But so you've actually done quite well to, um, to keep growing that domestic tourism. And it'll be interesting to see um, how well you go as the borders open and if you do manage to attract those, those international, um, international tourists back. It will buy sort of a comparative look. Um, domestic spend between 2020 and 2022 in Bola's grown 48%, um, which is the second highest increase out of 66. So again, sort of um, you know, top of the class, so to speak. Um, so I guess to, to summarise it all up, I mean, I think um, I've tried to provide a little bit of historic context without dwelling on it too much. Um, no doubt some pretty tough times coming through those sort of big transformations, but I think I guess when I look at the data now, I see, a, a, I guess, a, um, to use a corporate speak, a, a bit of a right-sizing process. Um, you know, you lost a major employer, a major industry, and it's it's taken the time to do an adjustment to get to, um, to I guess, to, to cut your cloth for that new size. But we're seeing that the, the economy is starting to grow really strongly off that new base and sort of, um, yeah, yeah, really growing within its, um, within its new sort of um, shape and form. Um, so that's me. I'm happy to take any questions. That's great. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'll just pass over to councillors for questions, and we have one from Councillor Rutherford. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, look, uh, Councillor Phil Rutherford. And look, a wee question in terms of the um, GDP growth, you know, that looks pretty nice on, on the chart. Are you able to determine how much of that is related to the big spike in um, international hard coke and coal prices during that same period? Is that one of the major significant factors in this big lift in, in the district's GDP, uh, given that we know that that's not necessarily sustainable? Have you got a comment on that? Um, I don't think so. I think we, um, <coughs> for these more recent quarters, we use um, a sort of a broader range of indicators that won't go down to that level of depth. So we'll more be tracking, for example, the broader coal market rather than specific submarkets. Um, and you know, key factors going into that are just that confidence in consumer spending and tourism, which is you know when you have that sort of level of increase in those areas, that does um, does drive GDP too. Thank you, um, Nick. I've just got a question. Question. You talked about. Um, with regard to population, a 3.5 increase in health enrollments. Could, could you just give a wee indication, if you can, what, what does that equate to in, in a potential increase in population? So, I know it's not a percentage, more of a number. Um, I mean, normally, um, we, we, I guess we expect the health enrollments to work sort of one to one with all the trends. So, you, you know, on average, you would expect a 3.5% increase in health enrollments to translate to a 3.5% increase in population. It doesn't always work out that way. You can have sort of um, different things that skew, skew it from time to time. So, it's more, I guess, a direction and strength of travel um, indicator. Um, uh, in terms of actual numbers on the ground, it's probably something in the order of low hundreds, I would have thought. Um, so, it's more, I guess, it's probably a more symbolic turning, if you will. Um, turning of that of that um, of that decline trend, and again, um, I guess I wouldn't necessarily expect it to jump straight to a three point five percent population growth because it is a little bit at odds at what the the longer term trend had been. Okay, thanks. For that. I, I still see it as a very encouraging sign, though, considering that most other uh, signs in the past have always been talking about decline. So it's it's encouraging. I think it's an outstanding report and um, um, something that we can. As a district, feel um, very pleased and proud of that we've, with how well we have gone over those five years, um, especially in the current terms of climate, climate that we're in, with um, COVID especially, and, and with our own um, you know, around flooding and so on in, in Westport. So um, it's quite an outstanding result, really. Uh, any further questions of Nick? If you let me get one more comment in, um, just on that population yes. point, um, just for a bit of context, which I probably left off. I mean, um, we had very uh, an outflow of people um, from New Zealand and net last year. Auckland's population declined last year by a fraction, but it did decline. So um, you're not in a bad club as well, um, you know, having that small population decline last year. Great, thanks for that, Perry. <coughs> Okay, I think anything further. No, th thank you, Nick. Thank you for making the time to come along today. Much appreciated. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Bye.
Okay, so we just need a, um, a draft resolution here that council note the contents of the report and the attached infometrics report. And I'll have someone move that way, please. Councillor Howard seconded Councillor Bowden. All in favour? Any against? Carried unanimously. And welcome back, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll probably propose I'll perhaps do the next item, then we'll have a small break and then you take over. Okay. So we're up to agenda item number six, which is the Westport Rating District, District Joint Committee um, draft minutes. And these have been presented for information. Uh, CEO Sharon, is there anything further to add? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, do, I'm not going to add anything. As you can see, I've put um, Councillor Rutherford and Councillor Howard as, as reviewed by as they are representing onto that committee and, and um, really for them to, if they wish to provide any further information. Okay, um, Councillor Howard. Just one clarification to start with. Um, it actually is... Uh, it's correct, it was the approved minutes have been presented from the April um, meeting, whereas it's headed draft minutes from 4th of May, meeting. so just to correct that. Yeah. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Howard. Councillor Rutherford, anything to add? Um, Madam Chair, no, but obviously you're asking about any questions and matters of clarification. It's always a bit hard to you know, read minutes and get an exact feel for the actual discussion. Sometimes it's because it's the way it's been reported. So if there's any confusion or more than happy to try and answer questions. Thank you for that offer. I think there's probably a number of councillors that are actually following the meetings as well. So um, it's it's actually very, I would encourage anyone that can to tune in when the meetings are on. They're very, very informative, um, good to keep up with. Okay, so no questions. Um, so I'll resolve that Council receive the report for information. Can I have a second, please? Councillor Nair, all in favour? Any against? <coughs> Very unanimously. Thank you. Now we're just going to take a very short two minute break while I shuffle myself to the other end of the table and um, Mr Mayor will come in to chair the balance of the meeting, thank you. We're still live streaming councillors, so deal with it. Oh, oh. I'll, 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 I'll take, I'll go. Let's see we'll get our slug muddled up. Yeah, you I'm taking Okay. Right, thank you, Deputy. Um, apologies uh, to the meeting for my absence at the start. I've been uh, meeting with um, Minister David Clark, uh, who's been in town uh, touring uh, some of the flood damage. He's had a briefing from us on that, and his particular interest is in, well, he wears several hats, um, but the main one was around um, insurance hazard, uh, hazard insurance bill and um, insurance in terms of um, climate adaptation as, you know, things like um, um, retreat, coastal retreat, that kind of thing plays out over the coming years. And also a bit on resilience around um, uh, communications and electricity and the vulnerabilities of places like Bula in terms of major disruption in the event of things like AFA. So that went well. Okay, thank you. Carrying on then to agenda item uh, number seven. 
the CEO report. Sharon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so uh, in the report today, um, you'll see that the second recommendation is with regards to correspondent uh, from Groundswell, New Zealand. Uh, but to start with, I initially want to draw your attention, particularly to our um, relationship meetings um, that I have with Kiwi Rail and their senior executive team. And I thought it worthy of mentioning that in my report this month. Um, we have very good, positive and productive um, meetings. And I thought it important to share that um, the, you know, from the even the most recent um, rainfall, the Kiwi Rail team have been working really hard to try and keep the Buller Gorge open. I've put a, included a photograph in there that shows, again, some of the damage that has been sustained in a similar area to that that was damaged um, in February of this year. So there are certainly some um, ongoing challenges, but um, yeah, they, you know, they're working um, pretty hard to make sure that our rail tracks um, continue to be open and, um, and ensure that you know, the transportation of coal, et cetera, um, is able to uh, continue as expediently as possible. What's also really promising is the fact that um, Kiwi Rail have decided to upgrade and invest in Westport and upgrade in their operational facility, which is really great news and again sends a level of confidence um, around ongoing business into Westport. So um, they very kindly agreed to let me show you some of the schematics. Um, and they're very smartly building multi-purpose um, uh, buildings that um, uh, could be used for future purposes for other other means and reasons other than Kiwi Rail. So being very forward thinking, um, and again, it's really great to see a um, a new build of investment between 1.2 and 1.4 million New Zealand dollars um, occurring. And again, that's good for our um, our local builders as well. And um, they've got their design phase, and then they will be going out, I believe, to tender for the build. Uh, probably, I think, towards the end of the year. Um, and then uh, the correspondence from Groundswell. So all the chief executives of the territorial authorities have received this uh, correspondence, um, and particularly uh, those that have, um, whose councils are not signed up to the um, Community for Local Democracy um, group. Um, so I had circulated the correspondence to councillors previously, but I thought it appropriate to bring it through in my report. I have sought advice from um, LGNZ in terms of um, uh, how to, to deal with the correspondence. Um, you can see from my report that I've indicated that I will respond under the Laguima, which is appropriate. Um, and so we've advised um, the group that that's how we will treat their request. And there is also um, no requirement for council to respond to Groundswell, um, other than via the Logoima process to the two questions that they have asked. But I thought it worthy to, to table the, um, the letter and correspondence for information in a public setting. Thank you. So aside from the Groundswell discussion, is there anything else to get clarification on? Councillor Howard. It is, it is clarification. Under five, the last bullet point, um, I know we're putting together the submission around the draft national adaptation plan, but it's just got to be not there to be tabled on the May agenda for endorsement. So can you give us an update? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Yeah, very good point. Um, uh, at the time of writing the report, the intention was to bring um, the, the submission here. Um, we've still got some further work to do. So an invite will go into your calendars for the 1st of <coughs> June after the um, annual plan hearings to have a short lineup regulatory governance committee meeting purely for the purpose of reviewing the submission. Um, and Councillor uh, Rutherford has kindly, as Chair of Regulatory, agreed to that meeting taking place, and we will circulate the submission in advance so that councillors will have had an opportunity to review it and ask any questions prior to the meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, so we will have a discussion around this groundswell letter, and I, I concur um, with the Chief Executive's position around a Lagoima for the questions one and two. 
however, the letter does um, request council consider withdrawing funding from LGNZ and holding a referendum on Three Waters policy and consider joining the um, Communities for Local Democracy um, group, as some councils have chosen to do. So I'm interested just to, I'll, I'll share my personal view. Well, I'm, 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 I'm looking for guidance around the table whether any of those three things are something this table wishes to do. Uh, my personal view is that our community won't be well served by doing any of those three things. Um, but I just, um, I guess, wouldn't mind gauging the table in terms of views on those issues around withdrawing from LGNZ, a, a referendum on Three Waters, and whether or not we had a desire to join communities for local democracy. Noting we had a discussion about that at the initial invitation and there was um, financial commitment being asked of council to join that group. And at the time, the, um, the council's resolve was that we weren't interested in that, in pursuing that at this time. So I'll just put that on the table and I'll go to Councillor Hawes first. Um, honestly, and I'll lead off, but you know, I see no reason that our position would have changed. If anything, I think our, our position should have strengthened. You know, the um, dealings that we constantly struggle with with our um, small, multiple uh, rural water supplies. Um, we, you know, I think. If anything, the poster child of um, why this needs to happen and um, why Three Waters needs to happen. Um, and I think that the um, issues around ownership, uh, my personal view, and I'd like to put it out there publicly, is that um, ownership of these things are, is only temporary anyway. Um, we are here at the moment. I might be a ratepayer that's just bought into the town and I haven't. You know, you know, my ownership is purely around buying the house. Um, the, the system is put in place by the most likely our great great grandparents and grandparents, and ownership therefore isn't going to change. I'll still remain public. So, all of the above, I think, is just, um, you know, to me, um, leading us away from the, the key points which are, you know, we need to do something. The only thing that we possibly can do is do the streets and numbers. So I have no change in my position. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Howard and then Rutherford. Um, I don't see that our position has changed. I think you did a very good uh, response in the letter last year. I think maybe Kevin Smith was, was from the right part and um, your response on our position <coughs> seems the same. I see that the point in subjecting our rate right payers to the cost of doing a submission process because it's, it's not under our control of central government that they should be performing submissions. That should be through the central government process. Um, I fully support um, local government New Zealand. They provide us with a big range of different services. We've we'll used them well for advice. As a councillor, I've um, learned a lot and been able to access a lot of reports and gain further not, uh, knowledge from issues that we're having to address. Um, so, and I do believe we have to be at the table. We have to be having conversations. You can't sit in the background and <coughs> the, the world, the sky's going to fall down. You've got to sit and work through your issues. So, this is what we've got about New Zealand. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I feel pretty strong about this. Um, and I'm in total agreement with yours and our CE's position uh, that it's simply be a government response to this letter. I, I would hope that you're not going to ask for a vote uh, at this table today in regard to those points. However, I'm quite prepared to, to get my stance. Um, I strongly am in, am in favour of council um, working. Um, <coughs> With the, the three waters um, within the three waters framework, I think it's advantageous, advantageous for our community to do just that. Given um, a couple of things, as Councillor Howard's already stated, it's, it's a, a, almost certain to be a done deal. Um, I would be, if I was a betting man, I would even think that even if there is a change of government, and I might be 
people shot down in the Peace of Tomorrow for saying this, but I find it extremely unlikely that they would make any significant changes to the three water reform if they have that, if it's passed by the legislation before they, they come to be. And my understanding is that legislation will be passed under the current government. Um, and you a new government may make some changes to the system, but I think it's highly unlikely that they would turn the clock back and, and just say, no, no, we're going back to what was prior. So strongly support um, the council working proactively in, in that space, given that we know what it means for our communities and the fact that everybody knows um, that our current uh, three walls needs a major um, overhaul. So absolutely. Um, and I'll just say that I even find it marginally offensive to, to get letters from these types of organisations. I mean, if they want to run council, let them stand candidates in the upcoming election. And if they're, if they're, it's an uproar out there in the community, then they'll be, uh, they'll be sitting at this table and not me. So that's my position. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, a lot. Anyone else want to speak on this? Does anyone have a counter view to any of that? Even highly. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. It's a good discussion. Okay, somebody, any other questions out of the broader CE review or uh, CE, not review, report? That's six months, man. Yeah. That's still coming. That's still coming. <laughs> okay, can somebody move? Oh, my run sheet. Um, what are we asking here? That we note the content of the CA report and councils note the correspondence received from Groundswell. New Zealand, and we've had a good discussion on that. Moved Councillor Hall, seconded Councillor Weston. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Any against? Carried, thank you. Right. This report, agenda item number eight, page 84 of Diligent. Um, I suppose I'll quickly whip through it. So the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs is, again, um, that bit of commentary there is what I need to provide into the reporting to central government each month. So they ask for any local um, emerging issues or opportunities. So that's kind of why that commentary is perhaps slightly, you've already seen it in some other areas. Um, steady progress there. Um, nine candidates in April and strong interest for signups into May and June. So we have reached out for the additional 50,000 in funds and um, awaiting confirmation of, of the availability of that. Uh, Mayor Relief Fund as written, um, again, thanks to uh, Deputy Mayor Roach, Councillor uh, uh, Rutherford and Ned Tafferty and Di Rossiter who are still diligently running that little committee to um, distribute those funds uh, weekly. Um, and there is still a reasonable balance there for people as they move back into their homes. Um, TTPP, um, that's all noted there. Not a lot else I'd bring your attention to there, I don't think. I'll turn to the, um, the oh, well, it's good to have the um, National Party members of Parliament coming through and having opportunity to um, meet and build a bit of a relationship um, with them. Uh, they're certainly um, eager in their um, endeavour to develop policy, um, and so they're quite keen to hear, um, you know, various issues around, you know, West, from a West Coast perspective that they'll hopefully reflect in whatever their policy is should they become government at some point. So quite important, those little relationship meetings. Um, the only other thing I will turn to is correspondence. So noting there was also an outgoing correspondence as a um, public forum reply to Mr. Lightbound last month, which was written and sent, but it's been missed off this um, list, but it was largely just reporting the um, resolutions of council for the Waimangaroa water paper that was in last month's. And again, I seek the guidance of the committee of the council on any response to the Professor Caswell um, alcohol harm minimization um, letter. And effectively I've replied with a, I will get back to you once I've discussed this with council. So if there's any 
um, reply from a regulatory point of view around work we want to do in that area. Um, other than that, I'll take any other questions from the meeting. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank, thanks again, Mr Mayor. Look, in relation to this work from uh, the Health Coalition, uh, Kira, um, it's interesting uh, reading. Um, a lot of the proposed changes to legislation are, are concerning um, territorial authorities that have LAPs in place, and of course we don't have one. So some of the stuff that we're seeking is probably not applicable. But look, I, I absolutely, in principle, um, support what the, the, the amendments are trying to achieve. And I'm just wondering whether it's um, something for your consideration to maybe pass on to the chair of our current licensing committee for any comment. Uh, I'm not sure of the appropriateness of that given that it's coming to council. But I'll just ask you to consider that because I do believe that it, it should engender a response from council, um, hopefully a support of one. But um, I'd be interested to know whether it would be appropriate to include um, our licensing captain or the chair. Thank you. Any other? Um, so I guess would that be better formulated as a reply via the via your committee, Councillor Rutherford, as regulatory? Or is it strictly licensing matter? Mm, Mr. Mayor, I'd be keen to have um, our library manager review on that if it's okay. You may not have read that letter. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, it's very deep into the deep. How do you call it part of that? Sorry. Um, so, so it's a letter from the Health Coalition at Teoroa seeking um, Buller District Council. Councillor <laughs> Rutherford, do you want to? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting, isn't it? Because they're not actually requesting the outright support, are they? They're, they're talking about us changing alcohol policy, encouraging councillors to re request a comprehensive review of the Act, show support for a private member's bill, raising the need for a board, broad review of alcohol law at the local government New Zealand conference later this year. So, so, so clearly, Mayor, you know, the, um, the bill, amendment bill, uh, it's, it addresses some seen shortcomings within the current licensing uh, so process. Shortcomings is identified by the people who propose the bill, obviously. And, and I guess what they're seeking is whether we, uh, in terms of our, the way we manage our alcohol licensing within our own uh, area, do we, do we support the views expressed in the, the <coughs> bill, if you mean the bill or not? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I have a suggestion that perhaps, um, and forgive me not looking at the timelines, that perhaps this is worth um, wrapping into one of the regulatory meetings as to whether you would, um, uh, the committee would seek to have a, a submission of some description put forward. Um, and we could tie it into um, the next regulatory meeting if you wanted to give it due consideration. So, so, so thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I would just probably pre-warn you that if, if, if this was, if we're the council are looking for a response from uh, the current licensing committee, the first thing that probably recommend is to get up to the NIP and then move down this path as well. So just giving you a heads up in that regard. Okay. So I'm not hearing anything from any other councillors, so maybe I'll... I was just going to suggest I do seek um, advice from Chair of the current Licensing Committee. I'll share the letter with him and seek input. Um, and I'll come up with a reply. Councillor Howard. Um, just, just for the public, I just wonder if it'd be a letter of response for the resource management reform. There's a lot of abbreviations. I just wanted to add a clarification for anyone that may be listening in, if you could uh, explain what TTOPP. MBEA, SBA, RSS, and MBEP, just so anyone's trying to pick up on what this letter refers to, they've got a bit of understanding. Okay, dokey. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Okay, I'll just get to that in a sec. So, are we, are we clear with the with the response on the licensing committee? I think everyone's happy with that. Okay, good. Okay, so this was our, our feedback into the resource management reform. Yes. So TTOP is the Titai Opotini plan, which is the one district plan. Um, NPEB is a natural natural built environment plan. And the RSS is, is the policy statement. regional spatial strategy. So these are um, these are um, acronyms around the um, the legislation that's coming through to replace the RMA. So the proposal is um, is a three sets of legislation: the Natural and Built Environments Act, the um, Spatial Planning Act, Strategic Planning Act. And, a, and an additional um, climate change adaptation um, act piece of work. So this was just feedback on uh, on the uh, planning boundaries. So more of the um, spatial planning aspect of that group of legislation. Rachel, do you have anything further to add on that? Just only noting that the that was all spelled out in the council paper. It was resolved before it was the draft. Sorry, in the regulatory. Yeah. And noting the letter, the the uh, recipient of the letter is the person who came up with the acronyms. <laughs> the audience will would have well understood our letter, <laughs> as opposed to if I was putting this in the Westport News or something. Um, okay, councillors, any other discussion on the Mayor's report? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, um, I know that there's no um, many cheers um, um, report tonight. So, can I ask you a question? Because I see you attended the Federation Mining meeting in Reefton, and uh, we noted that there's 47 employees at the moment and a number of subcontractors. Um, did you, are you still alarmed or should we be alarmed at the lack of housing in Reefton? And um, what should we be doing about it? Given that they're going to 147 staff yes. within a year. So there's no doubt there is an impending um, excess of demand over supply of housing in Reefton, currently and predicted. Um, there's some very forward-thinking property developers in Reefton <laughs> that are sitting on reasonable amounts of um, vacant land. Uh, and there's a council um, land uh, property, property, property rationalisation project underway that will seek to free up further land. Um, but it does not hurt, as you have identified, to shine the light on the opportunity, which is Reefton housing. And I guess... The, um, it, all effort should be made, I guess, to encourage entrepreneurs or developers to uh, embrace that opportunity. Thank you. Noting that beyond that, it's largely outside of council's yeah. control. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My apologies. I um, entirely forgot to put the uh, chair's update, verbal update of the agenda. That's right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, for creating that excellent opportunity. <laughs> so we have recommendations there to receive the report for discussion and information and receive a note incoming and outgoing correspondence and councillors have indeed provided direction for any responses or additions. Would somebody like to move that way? Move Deputy Mayor Roach, seconded Councillor Na. All those in favour? Yeah, okay, that's, that's unanimous. Thank you. Right, agenda item nine. Cutamere Domain Camping Ground and Bowling Club Water Supply Options. Now, this paper has been prepared by Ms. Trigg. Do you wish to speak to it before we open it? Oh, Rachel? Town Road will speak to it before we open it for further discussion. And a few questions um, circulated. Um, by email prior to the meeting with councillors. So. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the paper you've got in front of you today brings to council an update following on from the May 2021 paper that was to you. I believe that was a year ago, but as you're aware, a lot has happened in the intervening time. Uh, essentially, it shows that we have done what was requested based on the council resolution and direction at the time was to proceed with looking at council paper over the year that was applied for the school. And given, as councillors are aware, there are a lot of changes in the form going on in the drinking water space, particularly at the moment. Uh, it was prudent for us just to go back and revisit some of those assumptions, retest some of the costings and some of the technical basis that that original recommendation was based on. What the report has concluded is that that is still sound and recommendation stands. So councillors will be aware that the drafting plan has gone out on the basis of setting a rate for council to take over the water supply to serve the Karami School and Karami Reserve, which is home to the Domain Campground and the Bowling Club. And obviously that has to go through its process and final decision on whether that is great for the request for those parties can only be made for the easy and process. So what this report simply seeks to do is bring back to council is that technical information, a highlight any shift or amendments since we last presented to you on this topic uh, back in May last year, and highlight that the community vote forward is still uh, in the reading we suggested. We have, as Mia Jamie alluded to, received some questions from council in advance, and, and we thank you for that and giving us an opportunity to just get some of that information together because we understand there's a lot. And this is kind of is quite technical. <coughs> uh, some of the particular issues related to the need to relocate the treatment plant from the school ground onto the county owned ground. Since the paper was written and subsequent to receiving those questions from council, Ms. Trevor's had some further conversations with the Ministry of Education. And I know I understand the letter was read out uh, before I arrived at the meeting from the school board of trustees, suggesting that they were quite happy with the equipment to stay. Uh, the Ministry has stated very clearly that their position is that they want it removed from the property, noting that the school is actually Ministry of Education property, the school board is the overseer's operation, but their stance uh, had originally been and still stands that they would like council to take over that infrastructure and they would like it removed from the school grounds. They have always been a willing partner in this, they've been exceptionally good to work with and thank them for continuing to do that. They are still willing to gift that asset to council, but they have made it quite clear that the position is they would like it moved off the school grounds. Uh, part of the reason around recommending that is the health and safety and risk aspects. As you can imagine, operating a water treatment plant, there are chemicals, there's machinery, there's equipment, etc., that comes with a high degree of risk. If that is cited on property that is not owned or controlled by council, uh, we still take on that risk and we don't have total control over the access to that facility. When that facility is cited on school grounds, when you have children present when members of the community go when you can't get tight control, the opinion of staff is that that risk is too high and so we raise that the council the suggestion had been the plan slightly moved, but now that we've had that feedback from the ministry, I have made it so very clear that they would like to see that moved off the ground. Um, that shows that there is a way that we can move towards having a compliant water supply for those two parties in the area. I think it's worth highlighting that <coughs> if we were to take over the supply today, this, today the supply complies with the more driven water regulations as they are today. It's only if and when they change later in the year and all the indications are that they will change, that the supply will become non compliant. And apologies, it is difficult for us to say emphatically in the report this is exactly what the standard would be, or that reform process is still being worked through. So we've tried to advise you around what we understand and believe it to be to the best of our current knowledge. Happy to take any questions. Questions through the chair, please. Councillor Horse. Yes, through the chair. Um, just, just around, uh, we hear that the thing has no chlorination at the moment, and that would be a requirement. At the moment, you're stating that it meets current concerns that will change. But if your coordination is not part of that standard, at least it's not free. So, these, so just and I'll we'll look to Mr. Williams maybe for this technical question on treatment. But the the um the regulations are changing one July, aren't they? So my understanding is they these things come into effect. They're still waiting for the bill to be passed through Parliament, and that's going to be happening. It's not, it's my understanding. 
and at that stage, then the new regulations will come in, and part of the new regulations is coronation of or disinfecting, affecting of the water system so that the um, coronation is performed. Which councillors, if you turn your mind back to a few weeks ago when we received mm -hmm. a paper around all of our supplies that from 1 July, they won't comply for various reasons around testing or residual disinfection or whatever. Councillor There was a second question, and that was around the three parties involved in water supply. Can you um, further those types of people? Can you repeat them for us? So we'll go on. Who's involved in this? Yep. Yeah, so the parties who would be served by the water supply are Karamea Hearing School and the Karamea Recreation Reserve. And on the Recreation Reserve are cited the Karamea Domain Camping Ground and the Karamea Bowl. So the supplementary that then brings me to we hear there's potentially three private parties on that one long. Is that what was that? No. So perhaps the Ministry of Education would be a more technically correct way to refer to the first of those parties. Okay. Um, any other questions, Councillors? Councillor Bowger? Thank you. So um uh, through Chair. The, um, I presume the Ministry of Education is aware that the cost for division of water is going to increase with the relocation, or as a consequence of the relocation. Through the chair, yes, the Ministry of Education is aware that that would be the case. They are aware of what the quantum of the target grant is likely to be. We've had that dialogue going with them for quite some time, and they are a really willing grant to pay. So further to that, are, are, are the other parties? i.e. the Bowling Club and Reserve, are aware of the likely cost of this year. Okay, thank you. I didn't, I wasn't here for public forum, so apologies. I'll go to Councillor Weston, then Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm just a wee bit confused because in this letter from the Board of Trustees, it says that the Ministry of Ed is happy with the current rate. Um, Disagreed with what the letter said, um, and they are quite committed to improving communication so we can move forward. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. It's a bit of a technical question, I guess. So let's just say that um, Council did not choose the option of taking over the current supply and we've got one or the other for the rainwater, whatever. So disassociated themselves completely from the current. Education department um, treatment and supply um, is taking place. Am I right in thinking that they would still be considered to be a water supplier anyway because they're supplying water to their own houses and the school? Would they would they not fall into that category of being a supplier? And if they were, then where's the impediment in saying, well, we're a supplier anyway, so here's a connection for you guys. Mr. Williams? Just to reply to that, um, the answer will be no, as long as it's on the same piece of land, the property that the, the school and the houses are on. If they're on separate pieces of title where they cross over boundaries, then yes, they will become a water supply for themselves. No different to Parliament and a number of the other government agencies that, that have water supplies on their properties that cross different boundaries, then that happens. If they're still on the same boundary on, in one title, then, then the answer is no. Right, you. Yeah, thanks again, Mr. Lee. So, so that discussion that we had at our regulatory meeting, we were talking about, you know, where the supplies were going to have to become fully compliant, and we discussed, uh, well, we discussed farms where a farmer might be supplying water to a number of. So, and so we now know with certainty, <coughs> supply will not be considered to be a, a water supply. Provided it's in the same boundary title. It's when it crosses titles that it becomes you become a supplier. So provided that their, their boundary titles are in their property, their houses are on the same boundary title, then from, from the discussions with that with that with some other ROI, the answer is <coughs> <coughs> 
Stay premier. Thanks, Mr. Ian. I'm posing my questions. Um, so my questions, uh, thanks so much for um, answering in detail my questions, which were um, primarily around risk and risk mitigation for keeping the treatment plant on the school on the history of education grounds. Um, I guess my question sort of segues from Councillor Rutherford's in, in that if we hadn't have taken this over, um, or do, um, then that risk would still remain with the Ministry of Education. I'm a little bit unclear about why the cost would have been in putting the treatment plant there if we knew in the future it was to be moved. Wouldn't it have been best to put the treatment plant by where the, the bore is? It just seems like a double lot of costs here. But, but it, maybe I'm getting the wrong end of the stick or, or maybe it had to happen that way. I just need an understanding and, and I'm trying to find a way that, we, that the costs just don't blow out because we've heard from um, Peter Gibson on behalf of the Reserve yeah. Committee, the Reserve Board, and um, about the costs and he also spoke about the operational costs. So I think that's something we also have to address now while we're discussing it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still slightly struggling with, with how we couldn't mitigate the risk when that risk would have remained if the, if the school Ministry of Education kept the, the supply even within the school grounds and didn't supply the main board and so on. I, I get that there's probably extra risk with fluoride, you know, chlorination in the future and so on, but I'm, I'm just trying to get the very best outcome without imposing a lot of cost on the community. Um, Ministry of Education obviously can afford it. Just wondering, in time, um, do the other two that are on this, um, is it affordable for them? So there's a couple of, a couple of bits to that. Ms. Chandra. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll try and step through the, the questions. So initially, initially the plan had been that the treatment would not be sighted in the school, and we had the initial conversations with the local council to take over. As I think was mentioned in one of the reports we had back in February last year, this project reached the point where the ministry had to move on and make some decisions for the school project to go ahead. And that's where the agreement was given that actually they could take the steps they needed to get that form supply started. Remembering that that was in the absence of council having made a decision firmly whether or not we would take it over. So the ministry ended up in a position of having to do the best thing they could do for that project to deliver that project while still keeping the dialogue open. If, if council does not take it over and become a new group supplier, then the Ministry has been quite clear that it is, has no interest at all in being network supplier for any other party because that is simply what the Ministry does, it's not the area of expertise. So any other party would be cut off and it is entirely yours to manage. As I understand, and Mr Williams will correct me if I'm wrong, that in the drinking water standards there are some differences between the type of network supplier and water supplier that you are. So by introducing different parties by becoming a network supplier, there are additional measures that you have to take, and that may be part of what would add to the risk elements of what would happen within the, within the treatment plant. Yeah, and then in a broad brush, but the key risk for us um, taking over that plant is uh, the upgrades that we will have to do moving forward. <coughs> And the fact that we'll that it's the gases that will come off that and a whole lot of other thing, issues, not having that secure enough for, for that particular thing. We leave ourselves open to, to, to chemical spills or, or misadventures happening. And around children, my question is, is, is that a risk that the council is a big part? We us as engineers look at it and we say it's not a risk that we would take, and that's what we've brought forward to you. Just coming back to the operating cost question, and apologies I missed the, the public warnings that didn't hear the public so committee had to say, but just for councillors of awareness, back at this time last year and earlier, we were talking with the subcommittee about what the likely cost would be, and if it is in, in the annual plan for the target rate, is the figure we had back a year ago, 
the subcommittee motion that it would be at its system down the bottom of that roughly what that rate would be for them, and then communicated at the time that that was affordable and they were able to, to meet that. Um, it's not particularly highlighted in the report, but again, for your information, there is background work going on about what could be done to reduce those operating costs as well. For example, looking at having somebody based in Caramere who's able to do the maintenance and monitoring on that plant rather than having to connect back to the school and send somebody from this school here. So, those permutations are currently being worked through because obviously we're very aware of a small number of rate payers and keeping those operating costs as low as possible. But also another advantage of moving the treatment plant is that if the stages that are connected to the people work through, as we get to stages three and four, it then becomes into the sphere of a different conversation, which would make it incredibly sensible to be located off site and then spread those costs across other parties and make it more affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Council Montgomery. Thank you. Um, to a certain extent, it feels as though we're kind of going over things like a year later. There's already 120,000 plus been spent, or considerably amount, it's already there. I look at the costs, and there's a whole lot of technology, nice words on that side there, and I'm looking at them going, I'm, I'm assuming it's okay. I'm uh, these estimates, there's ballpark figures, but there's no accurate figures in my eyes. So between 55,000 and 77,000, we're talking $1,000 to $1,500 a week to maintain this, irrespective of whether it stays where it is, whether you move it. So I do have a problem with that. It'd be cheaper providing all kids with um, bottled water than it would to have this plant itself. So I, I do struggle with that. The, the, the ongoing costs over a period of time for both the education department and the domain in the bowling club, I don't think it's probably going to be sustainable for that small community. I know we've only, it says we've only got three, um, three parties involved, but in effect, you've probably got 120 people potentially on a daily basis if you've got the school and what's like that there. So I think the ongoing costs are going to be probably too much for those communities. So I would actually like to have a more accurate cost put together. Um, before we go into the annual plan, we actually start, so, yeah, we have to make some decisions. So I'm not overly happy with that. The other one is just as a, to make things fair, if you have to ascertain who is going to be paying for things, is it going to be measured? It is. is it going to be measured? Because if it's not measured, it's a more It's just a... The recommendations would be in the use of policy. Probably this council would be meeting, but that's something that has to come back to council to agree on before we can make that decision as, as offices. Yeah. And with regard to costs, operating costs, I think what we need to be reminded is that I presume this is reflecting the potential monitoring and, and maintenance of the network under the anticipated regime that you're going to have to do to maintain the system as best you can rather than perhaps what the status quo is where, where there's actually, no one's actually testing this stuff anyway. So, I mean, there's additional work involved in meeting the obligations come 1 July than what doesn't exist now. Um, Councillor Bowden. Um, thank you. The um, next question then is, uh, sorry, I'm from uh, Councillor Roach. The refresh my memory, but the, the Ministry of Education pays the pipe from the ball down to the school. So that's good. So um, is it then an arbitrary decision as to where the treatment plant does go? Would it not be if there is a an option to actually put it up near the ball, which is up where the bulk of caramel lives, would one not do that rather than putting down the other end and having the pipe water all the way back up should be extended like later day? So MC. That is correct, that, that that will be our first option. The second option would be just to put it in the reserve, but the first option would be to locate the back um, market across all, close to there, so that when anybody else that we feed onto that line in the future will have treated more the way from, from the start. Councillor Weston, sorry. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my, going to be my question as well. So. Councillor Horse. <laughs> Yeah, I just said, um, 
I'm finding it quite difficult to process what I'm being asked to do here because on page 109, the ministry states that this is a container of this treatment plant. And then I move through to page um, wherever we are that gives me the, um, the cost of uh, moving this at, um, at uh, 489,000 estimated. Um, it, 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 the figures make no sense to me to be able to try and get my head around because in another part I see that apparently a trip must lost and it's contained lost. So there's issues here that you know particularly it doesn't add up. Coming from a building background, having to do the math on building projects, I'd just like to get the gas guess that maybe it's the way it's been presented. I don't know. Okay, I think this additional equipment and things is reflecting the cost of chlorination, chlorination and all the rest of it. Mr. Williams, maybe you'll be the so, 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 Councillors, we've spent a bit of time on this one. Councillor Sampson. Well, where do I start? Two and a half years this has taken. Why the plant was put on the school was because council never got together to make a decision in time. Two and a half years we've had nine staff involved in this one project. We have had at least what I know of two consultants involved as well as legal advice. So it's taken a long time. In the end, the Ministry of Education said, we've got to move because we don't have water, we've got a school and we have to supply. Hence why it went on to the school. Hence $120,000 complete. And that was to take a pipeline from the board to the school. There is, as you say, a containerized um, system with in, right alongside the ball, which um, softens the water, um, and it has to be at the point of the ball because of the um, iron content. And at the school, it is just um, UV and filter systems. That's all at the school. This plant was put in place, bearing in mind that. Um, Chlorination was to come. So it's just a matter of an add on, which isn't a big one for the chlorination. Um, the people who put the part in and the um, consultants on that, they, I have spoken to them, I've given the staff the contacts. Um, I know Rachel has been in touch with their crew, what them, and um, their prices are significantly less than this proposal. As Margaret said, assume only, assume that words, assume, assume, three part figures, all parts. So, how can we take any confidence 
And these figures, when 12 months ago we were quoted for this at 250,000, now 12 months later, 489,000, near enough 100 percent increase. So, with the times back that it's taken two and a half years to get here, even if we got this in 12 months, is this going to be 489,000? What is it going to be? So, I don't believe that we should even be accepting this report at the moment. I think we need to do another report back. Um, because if we turn around and not take it on, the school has got license to occupy that pool. So it means our own property does not have any water. We have to go out there. Um, or put, put them all down and put our own treatment. Like the last resort I had to do because the cost was going to be, and I understand it's about 60,000 or not. How we got these costs, I can blow my own because even in here, they have 50,000 for a um, transformer. The transformer's just up here, even if they had to buy another transformer. I'm pretty sure, and the pump is already operating on the power that we've got. So why, you know, these figures are so far out, and it's distressing to have this because we go back to what was said about being able to afford. Yes, subcommittee. Yep, fine, sixteen thousand dollars will pay. But once you go up to stage two, when you have fifty-eight um, odd thousand dollars for maintenance. Which I assume them uh, running us, and I assume the maintenance includes the repayments, etc. on the loan. Well, that means the loan would be paying 22. Then when it goes up to $78,000, that means it's something like 30000 a year, working out proportionally of what that 40000 is now, that 40 percent which is completely unaffordable. So, therefore, the subcommittee. Agree with what's here now, but as sure as heck, with these prices and this report that's got no, gives you no confidence, can agree with it. So I believe this report should be put to rest and we get another report with more accurate and more detail. And going back to the Ministry of Education, I have spoken to them, not well. The person that has been dealing with us just a matter of three weeks ago when the school was um, blessed and he had no issues. So, we looked somebody else along the line that has come up and said they don't want to be part of it. I am somewhat taken back on that. But as I say, where do you go with this? And I agree with you, Dave. Where do you go? Because um, I'm pretty distressed. About the whole thing, I've been on the staff, and as I said, all the changes on staff for various reasons. And two and a half years later, we've got what I don't believe is a suitable report to make a decision. Thank you, Councillor. I'm just sure I have to ponder the way forward. I think what this paper reflects is the reality of becoming a network supplier. Um, which was decided by council at some point, although acknowledging the figures are high level because they haven't gone out to tender. Um, but again, I think it's, it's prudent if they are, you know, that's a whole other process, isn't it, to go to market? Just additional. Could I please be that the, Scott, the, the, the staff work with this? Um, the people who have put the present system on, who have <coughs> me that these costs are over the top and come back to us. Um, they have offered to work with the council, have a meeting, it hasn't happened, and I've got um, a letter here of an email to say that the school domain board and the council are more than happy to travel to Karamea to go over everything, see what is required, and work out a different price. And I request that that happen and another report comes back. 
Thank you, Councillor Hawes. Yeah. Well, I might not cross out what I've written down here in case somebody wants to find out what I've done. <laughs> it's just honestly, it is incredibly disappointing to get to this point now when back in the day we own a board as a council, as a group. I've stated at this table at that time, and why are we saying to the Ministry of, the Ministry of Education? You go and do your own more. We knew that we knew the implications of where this was going if we went down this path of allowing them to use the water. We then thought we understood that the ministry was going to put a treatment plant in, and then that we were going to be able to take over the treatment plant. Did we do our homework on our understanding that that treatment plant was going to be acceptable and it was going to be just merely a transfer with some added costs? No, it doesn't appear to be the case, does it now? Because now we're stepping into a whole new ball game. We have, we've given away the water supply that was public, that supplied our domain, that supplied our bottle club, that was outside of the ministry's realm, they could have done their own. And that was what we said at the time. It should be them, it's their problem. They should do the expenditure, they should crop the, the cost. Then we missed the second ball. They built this treatment plant, and this treatment plant doesn't mean what we're hearing that we need to have for health and safety reasons to operate it as a council treatment plant. Where was the communication of the understanding of what was being built by the Ministry of Education and why it didn't meet the requirements that we would need to have as a council? They, they would effectively let them off the hook for $360,000. We've effectively taken $360,000 spent into, our, into us and the right parts because we had a water supply as a single supply to a single point. No, that's, they they their own board. that's not correct, no, Councillor no, no. Hall. They were supplying us with water from the school. No, Ms. Townro, do you have any further comment around costs and the um, um, I don't know, the reliability of the estimates for the stages, further stages? So I've sat down with another engineer to, to re-verify these costs and they believe that those costs are a reason to get rid of it. There's a contingency sum amongst all of that, which when you go out to 10 domain, may go up and may go down. Um, the type of price, but we're expecting the price will not increase above that for, for those stages. We were prudent compared to other quotes that we've, we've had in the, in, in the past um, of making sure that we don't have to come back to council and ask for more money because that seems to be it. Might be our habits um, from our team sometimes, and I apologise for that. Um, we've made good, good attempts. To, to, to get best practice put in place so that we don't have to do anything again for a period of time. The maintenance is based on what it would cost us to have West Reef drive all the way from here over to there. There are ways that we can reduce some of those costs. We may also be able to reduce the cost when we go out to the end of by getting the previous person to, to apply for um, But until that happens, I can't. I, I, I would be remiss of, of giving you a lower price. And then have to come back and ask for more money. Okay. So I, I, I understand, I'll go to you. So I understand exactly that. These prices are hopefully worst case scenario. <coughs> and the exact price will be determined when you actually seek a supplier to, you know, to tender for this work uh, at some point. So I'm getting close to testing these um, resolutions. Um, Councillor Montgomery. So just playing devil's advocate slightly on it, just a couple of things. One is we should be starting here and there. So if they were suitably trained, yep, that would combat that. So the paper reflects that, Councillor, that yeah. there is going to be an attempt no, made to source a local. That's what the pricing is based on, but yeah. if the report actually contains somewhere in there around the likely attempt to source a local water yeah. contract. Where the bore is at the moment, which isn't made across, is the pipe that's going from there to the school, 
and then into the domain, because that's suitable for the future, the size of it, to have extensions to it. As in, people who are close by could add to it. The 63 line will cover that at the moment. It doesn't go into the domain. What happens at the main 63 line goes to the set point, then it changes to another <coughs> going into the store. From there, the store has a small pipe that feeds out to us. We would have to upgrade the pipe um, to the domain so that they can get proper their own feed without, without influencing the schools and have to have our own line anyway. We couldn't, unless we've got anything that's through the school, which is another issue. But, but yes, it could take most of the people from market cross down to at least the school and maybe if you have this past two at this so now. I just said one comment to make about the school and saying that they don't want to be involved in it. I think perhaps the discussion needs to be had with the school to say that when the regulation change on the 1st of July, they're going to have to do those changes to their shed anyway, because they are also going to have to then have the correct chlorine um, handling facilities that are also exactly what we would have to do. So they need to perhaps there needs to be perhaps a little bit of negotiation there because why would we have one and they have one? Because that's what's going to happen if we our desire is clearly to provide water to our community there. That's what we want to do at the best price. And I think the school, it's a little um confusing that some would say to Chrissy that no, we don't want to be involved, and yet the school board has not been advised of that. So that's a little worried to me. Discussion with that one question myself. I suppose he's a manager of what he's over there who's been dealing with a lot of the school stuff and was the first person that we became involved with during this process. Um, he was quite adamant that, that through, through the negotiation, through his discussions, that their expectations were that if we could take over that. Um, operating system that we would take it off their school grounds. Um, if you look at the, I've taken photos of the pump shed and how it's all set up. It's not ideally set up currently, and it would take a, a remodel for it to be currently set up to what they had to do, which would be a large sum of money as well. Because um, you can't just use plywood, you can't do what we've done. There's a whole lot of standards for a, for a water treatment plant and, and for operators and all of that. So, Saying that it meets and is, is fit for purpose is, is probably misleading. Um, they may believe that that's the case and may have been led into that, but if you understand that the new regulations and the new rules that are coming in that are, and that are currently in place, that is unacceptable for us to take on a part of that nature with the expectations to, to add other people in the future. I don't believe it's a good one. And I know my point, Mike, is that that is going to hit them as well. Like if we decide well, if not, we're not going to partner with them, they are going to have to do exactly what you've just said. Well, they should be doing it because it's Right, I think I've got one more question on the on recommendation three around the stage delivery of option two. So timelines. So I guess the, um, the nub of all of this is um, in the light of what we know is happening with three waters, reform um i don't imagine we would be rushing out to move this this infrastructure in the first six months of taking on the supply given that we're not doing that on any of our other supplies so i'm just wondering is this slightly um um my mind's my, the words gone out of my head but slightly um immaterial in the sense that it'll be like all our other supplies that it might be outgoing years before full compliance would be achieved on this network if I may, uh, the next question, Mr. Beer, any decisions to move into stages two and subsequent stages would need an annual plan or long term plan resolution because they will affect the rate. So that would then impact the timing. So you use it to look at moving into stage two, which be the next annual plan process this time next year. And that would be the decision the directors and council would have to pick at that time. So it's yes, certainly not something that we're going through. And to give some context, we'd be effectively adding this cost of this recommendation three, the stage delivery to the 
$35 million worth of other improvements that we're expecting to do on our um, seven suppliers around the district. And we'll be considering all of those through annual plans in our going years sometime between now and 1 July. 2020 XXXX. Okay, thank you. With that, Councillor Rutherford, we'll yeah, move yeah, on. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just want to leave one final thought. You know, it's been obviously clearly laid out and the options that are available to us that sort of do nothing thing will potentially result in the eventual closure of the campground on, on our reserve out there. I'm going to just throw it out there that the costs that we're looking at that will be imposed on them. We heard um, Mr. Gibson say tonight how do you expect us to pay? We've got a submission to our annual planning from the Caribbean Bowling Club saying there's no way they're going to afford $15,000 a year for water that they use again. Potentially, that place folds, the campground goes, nothing's left there. We're, so I just want the councillors to reflect on that and they make the decision. It's a good point. Is this, oh, I haven't read the um, submissions. That's in the, our submissions, is it? Yeah, it's a submission from the uh, okay. Caribbean Thank Bowling you. Club saying there's no way they can afford 15. That's what I asked for meeting. Is it yeah. meeting water? Yeah, this meeting's been told that, the, that both those organisations are aware of and in agreement with the rate that's proposed. Yeah, and uh, just clarifying if I may, please, that um, it was indicated that the bowling club would be paying 15000 um, which has since been clarified, and the bowling club, who uses a minor amount of water, just, they'll just go on the tank and do what treatment they need to do there, but the domain board subcommittee had agreed to pay a portion, so it is not for the bowling club in there, but the bowling club will sort themselves out. It just means the subcommittee, which is the subcommittee, our own property, so on. So basically, yeah, the bowling club is okay because the domain intended to pay that share there. Otherwise, they'll just look after themselves. Um, can, um, has anyone got anything new to add, or I'm just going to put these? Deeply uh, mean. Only in response to um, rating, and that's because I asked a specific question, which councils may have seen the response to, and that was a breakdown of the water rates for each entity connected to the to the school supply. Um, and it's come back to me that the rate breakdown would be 15,541 for the reserve and 31,000 for the school. So I'm taking it that that was based on the figures presented. So I guess following on from what Councillor Rutherford has said, the reason I asked that question was, can the campground even afford 15,000? Exactly the same thing. So we were pretty much giving them, ending up, imposing on them and a cost that would send them into um, the, the death knells of, um, of an operating campground. And that's something that isn't really spelled out here. Don't need to, I don't understand how that would work for that, for the campground. And so I guess that gets back to, have we got actually enough information to make a decision? Mm. Just to answer, um, I have had discussions with the subcommittee previously, and they did indicate that they're quite happy to pay that sum. Um, the information that's come forth today from them is different from the previous conversations, so again, we're happy to um, have those discussions. Council Voucher. When we discussed this a year ago, I seem to recall that one of the real options yeah. was, was that we expand the uh, supply network and we bring other people on, which would help to further costs, which would then um, uh, mean that um, uh, the, the, the domain doesn't have to pay the amount of this, our domain, I might add. So we're charging ourselves for it. So we've heard today that the last resort put his own board out. I mean, this is ludicrous. There's a water supply going right past their door and they're putting their own supply down. So why are we, 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 
we're worrying about small um, small things when why don't you look at this in the positive uh, positive basis which is let's actually go and make some money let's let's minimize the cost of growth at all and let's just put the system in and get it going because we can only talk about it for so long <laughs> yeah, what's another couple of hours? <laughs> I don't disagree with Councillor Badge and it's it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Sampson. Did we not consult with the Karami community um, some years back about whether they wanted to go on a reticulated um, water supply? And the answer was resoundingly no. <laughs> oh, Radio councillors, I'm going to put these, I'm going to move. Um, all three, I'll see if there's a seconder and then we'll put it to the vote. So we one, received the report for information. Two, the council endorses option two, limited network supplies the preferred water supply option for the Karamea Reserve and Karamea Area School, noting that the final decision on whether or not to proceed with this option we made as part of annual plan 22-23. And three, notes the potential for a staged delivery of option two, acknowledging that council would become a network supplier upon taking over the scheme and that the scheme would not comply with the currently proposed drinking water standards until stage three had been completed. Do I have a second? Me. Councillor Bowgen. I'm not going to ask for any further discussion. <laughs> All those in favour? Any against? Okay, so against is uh, Weston, Simpson, Rutherford, Talfordy. Um, Deputy Mayor uh, Robin Nair uh, and Councillor Montgomery and Councillor Motion. Uh, yes, the motion is lost. Well, the three recommendations are lost. Does somebody wish to propose a direction for staff? Deputy Mayor Roach. So there's a few items that I think need further clarification. Um, discussions with the Ministry of Education, um, because obviously what's come out today is, is different to what the school understands. Um, discussions with the Domain Board with regard to the level of how much cost that they can actually sustain without putting them under. Um, just will further costing up of some um, some firm costs perhaps around the operational costs so that we get some confidence in those figures. I just think it's looking like another report um, unless that can be wrapped in somehow to the annual plan deliberations which are only next week. Okay, I'll, before we take a deep dive into this then, I think start, um, my feeling is staff will have gathered um, where the gaps are in the knowledge or information provided. So if if we are okay to revisit um, recommendation um, one, and I will add to it a little bit that it is to receive the report for information and pro provide a, a direction for further information required. Through the annual plan. Through the annual, through the annual plan process from the hearings that take place next week. Yep. So, so one the council resolves one to receive the report for information, and provides. Yep. And directs the chief executive to report back to council on matters raised mm -hmm. as part of annual plan deliberations. Effectively, it's deferring the paper. Everyone's heard the conversation. Seconding or questioning? Uh, we're deferring it, but basically the deliberations are only a week away. Um, are we gaining anything? Are we going to have those further reports by then? Um, is there more clarity within that one week? And... Um, I guess we don't have the uh, feedback. It's really only for from one two parties, isn't it? Which we want. Um, what I look to staff is a realistic that you believe you can fill these information gaps between now and annual plan deliberations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We will try our absolute best to think about some of them we can. 
noting that at any plan deliberations is the time cap to estimate the decision whether or not the target of rate will go ahead into the end of the plan next year. So we will come back to you as much on that as humanly possible, noting that there are some constraints, for example, on pricing capital in the project, but we will be the next to the piece of the plan and the information will be in the deliberations. Further note on the final decision on the end of the plan for the 29 jury council meeting is absolutely necessary. That will give us another opportunity for the plan. <coughs> that clarification, Councillor Weston. Yes, I'm assuming that will preempt the public forum. Mr. Gibson, or will that go? Or will we have to wait till then? In terms of response, no, response in the public forum. Uh, yeah, we'll discuss his response at the end of the meeting. Yep, but it'll reflect whatever the decision council ends up making. Okay, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, look, is, is there any way that we can also ask staff uh, to consider ways that, um, that we could potentially absorb the cost of supplying water to our own reserve, even though it's managed by a committee and it's a commercial campground? Clearly, if there was some way of minimising that cost of the water supply to that group, and we continue to charge. We went on and charged the school the, the appropriate amount. Maybe this whole thing can proceed with that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have that done for me too, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we don't own your camera. Yeah, I know, but I own part of that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a right card. Sorry. Um, Absorbing costs is nice, it's a lovely thought, but in actual fact, when you do run a business, you actually have to work out what it costs you to run that business. And if it is a business in which it is happening up there, then they need to absorb their own costs and work out what they're charging and why they're charging it, especially when you're on a holiday park. So we're and diving into a slightly yeah. tangent here. But. Sorry. So, 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 Mr. Mayor, I've, I've got to say that there is a public good that was down there too. It's not just the campground. And maybe there's some way to start to work what would go to the temperature of the water tanks. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't want those either. Okay, so we've, we've, we've got a recommendation revised to receive a report for information. And have you not written that in? I've got an answer recounted. <laughs> Yep, the chief executive to provide further information as discussed into the annual plan deliberation. Just a question, just a clarification. Um, what, what I'm just, just in terms of um, what the plan um, is, a certainly um, by a certain number of people there. What's the reform around if it was a soil supply? What's the reform around treatment of that water going to the plant? Is it? It's the water supply on the water to, to, to those users as a benefit to um, get rid of down here because there was a supply of water and water source. So it's the process of these cows are very expensive. Okay, so moved. I've read it out a couple of times now. Seconded, Councillor Nah. All those in favour? Any against? That one's carried unanimously. <laughs> Why don't we just start there? Um, what are we doing about this time machine? No, we've advised them that we're running 30 minutes behind. Okay, so I've got 30 minutes. 20 plus a total. Okay, agenda item 10 property rationalisation uh, report. Uh, again, uh, I will maybe just go. Do you want to speak to this? Um, uh, Chris, Ms. I'll ask Ms. Trick to speak to it first and explain what it is asking of us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this report is asking for um, we've had an approach by King Laura regarding some of the land that is being sold as part of the property rationalisation project. Currently, it's two plots of land that they are interested in. Um, what may not have been clear in the report is that we absolutely would be using property brokers who are a um, real estate agent to sell to. Um, we've been in talks with um, property brokers who thought that this would be um, a good, um, good resolution for council to be able to do this and also for the community. 
um, just bearing in mind the property rationalisation project has got two parts to it. It's divesting council of assets that are underutilised and also looking at um, um, addressing the issue that we have in um, the community, which is that we have a, a lack of housing. Um, so I'll, I'll take the same question. Um, Deputy Mayor Roach, then Councillor Howard. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, so just with regard to this report, and thank you for that extra bit of clarification, um, Ms Truth, because reading the report, one would think that we were taking over the role of the real estate agent, and we all, um, so from, from my previous time in real estate, um, once you sign an, a, an agreement, agency agreement, then really you're placing it in the hands of that real estate agent, especially if they've then introduce a client or a customer to you, then um, you're up for the commission anyway, but you've, you've clarified that, that they'll be handling it. Um, I'll, I'll be voting against this because I do believe we've, we've gone down a path of um, putting these properties up for sale. We've had previous, previous reports which um, clearly state that these properties, these two uh, coming up for sale in the open market. And I think there, what we don't know is there well could be other people that have that are waiting for them, waiting, baited brief, um, as Councillor Brett Bowden would probably say, for them to come on the market and they might be just waiting to put in an, um, an offer. So I think in fairness to all those in, potentially interested in these properties, we should go down the path that we already were going to take in that would be that they'd go to the open market. If um, Kayanga or, or any other interested party wanted to put in an offer, they would. And then I think the outcome would be that we'd get the very best offer and um, a, a potentially a good price. Also would save the cost of a valuation on two properties. And I think it just adds to the absolute transparency of the whole process. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I tend to sympathise with that approach. Could I ask you whilst we further discuss this that you come up with a resolution that would give effect to that? Deputy, um, Deputy Mayor. Not okay. Jeff. One day and never. <laughs> <Councilman Duncan. laughs> um, I also agree and I'll also be voting against it because if we're going to do this for there, I'd request that every property does that. And um, uh, we do a valuation for every property because I know for a fact that value is at the moment have a very negative value uh, uh, view on Westport and um, to a lesser extent Reefton by virtue of recent events and the fact that the interest rates are going up and a whole bunch of other things uh, and that is not the, there's not the evidence in the market itself and the valuers um, that I've been dealing with um, uh, I personally think are um, uh, not seeing the true value in the land. And the only way to test that is by going to the market mm -hmm. and uh, kind of go to the market like everybody else. Yeah. And we'd be doing ourselves a service. So there's two ways we can do this. We can move and second all of these and then vote them down, if that's the view of the table, or we can just, let's just do a simple resolution that, that we stick with the previously approved sales process. Um, that was going to be my suggestion, Mr. Mayor. We're already gone down that path. Yes. In fact, this, this, these resolutions are now moot point, aren't they? Because we've just, if we are agreeing, although there may be people or councils around the table that don't hold the same opinion, so maybe you do have to test the resolutions. I'm, I'm unsure. Well, everyone's put their hand up to move them. So I'm suggesting that we go for a resolution one that we receive the report for information and that we. Uh, having considered the report, Council directs that the previously approved sales process be um, stands or be continued. In ours. In ours. It carries on. In ours. I'd be happy to move those two resolutions, Mr Mayor. Move Deputy Mayor Roach. Seconded. Were you seconding? Yeah. Move. Seconded. Councillor Weston. So those are the two resolutions on the table. Moved and seconded as opposed to what's in front of you. We received a report for information and that we, uh, having considered the report, uh, resolved that the previously approved sales process be continued. Uh, people speak to that, Councillor Rutherford. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just show you, you know, keep an open mind. I came to this meeting thinking this sounded like a pretty good proposition for us. And and you know we want to help kind of order out, but you know since the articulation of of, of Deputy Brooks and 
and Councillor Bevan. Um, I have changed my mind and I'll be supporting them. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further discussion, you will, you will understand the resolutions we're putting. My name too. I uh, move Deputy Seconded Councillor Weston. All those in favour? Any against? It's carried. Thank you. That was quick. Agenda item 11 is the Punicoke Water Supply Acquisition of Land Update. Now, this is just noting the contents of the report for our information, as this is a legal process still continuing. Um, is there anything further you want to add? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, th th we thought it was timely to um, just bring a, an update report back to, to Council because we acknowledge that this is a, um, a fairly long process and it's been a wee while since we'd updated uh, councillors as to where we were at in the process. So following on, um, as the report states, from the, the February 2020 resolution um, and progressing through the Public Works Act 1981 to um, to acquire the interests of the land. Um, the landowners have since um, filed an objection with the Environment Court um, and um, we anticipate um, going to the Environment Court in the next couple of months. It's um, also compounded by the fact that the landowners have actually decided to represent themselves um, and that, of, um, as one would expect, provides some challenge challenges um, along the way, which is uh, perhaps contributing to the length of time that the process is taking. Um, and so we just thought it was uh, important to, to update. Um, I have been asked by um, a, a few councillors with regard to the legal costs to date. So far, um, there's been 180k spent, but that is over a seven year period. This, is, uh, I'll, this has been a long term um, uh, uh, issue dating back to 2015 it may have started so um, and in terms of that as the cost to date over the last seven years which is roughly averaging about 30k a year so um, we have had recent correspondence um, which has indicated that we will expect to be um, in the environment court um, by August so that we should have a resolution by that point at that point I should say Okay, Councillor Rutherford. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for a very comprehensive report. I think we've, you know, we've all followed it all along the way. And in fact, it's not quite right that we haven't been updated recently because we were given some information not so long ago about the potential for environment court. Look, I, I'm accepting that the paper is very comprehensive. I'm happy just to move the record. Thank you. Seconder, please. Seconder, Councillor Montgomery. Any further questions on that, Deputy Mayor? Yeah, um, this won't impact my um, voting, but I just just for clarity, at the bottom of page 124, um, when, it, when we talk about if the supply is no longer needed, so this is like in the, in the future, it says it's understood that the land purchase would be returned to the owners and easement surrendered. So just this is a, just a general question. Is that, is, are we saying that we would go through all this process and then if we had, if in the long run, we had another supply for the land, that the land just goes back to the owner? They don't repay us for any of it? I understand it's a public works act. It's public works. how it works. Yes. But also in the paper, it, it indicates that we do, there is no long-term solution. Oh, around. I get that. I was just... It's just for clarity, does that how that works? That's correct. So we're very much guided by the Public Works Act, and that would be one of the requirements. Loosely, I think the Public Works Act allows you to take it for a specific purpose, and if that purpose no longer exists, yes. you offer it back to the original landowner or variations on that theme. Councillor Howard? Could we be argued that would need it for resilience, though, as a second supply in case? Like um, storm surge or something up the river, given that it's a long way up, but any possible natural hazard that would affect the future supply, that it'd be good to have it as a residual option. Um, I think potentially, but yeah. again, we're a long way off having a, an alternative source. Decisions on shutting down or not would be um, a matter for a on paper and outgoing years, I suspect. Yeah. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Any against? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, I want to do public forum response now. I wasn't here, so we heard from Mr. Peter Gibson. 
Was there this another one? Yes, uh, Vita from the um, Karamea Area School Board of Trustees was read as part of public forum this year. Oh, yep. Um, same reply to both. I think so. And what does that reply? That we might suggest that the resolutions that we've um, put forward and that we come back next week to the annual plan process. And you could go into detail, but I think that's probably enough because they, they may well want to be part of it. They can listen to that, can't they? Whatever that deliberation is. Anything further anyone wants to add? Councillor Howard. I think that one of the main reasons behind the decision is the Ministry of Education's um, position on it, so I think that needs to be clarified in the letter. Well, we'll be seeking further information on several um, points, won't we? Councillor Rutherford. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Without wanting to labour this point, the letter from the Board of Trustees was sort of support mechanism. I think it's probably a good appropriate that we point out uh, in the response that their letter seems to be an honest information received from the Ministry of Education. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay, somebody, oh, we don't need to move that. That's just guidance. Thank you. So I'll do those two responses tomorrow. Okay, public excluded. Um, agenda item 12 to move into public excluded uh, to discuss Westport Port and Dredge. Uh, reasons being to enable local authority holding information to carry on without prejudice or disadvantage negotiations, including commercial and industrial negotiations. And section 2B2 would be likely unreasonably to prejudice the commercial position of the person who supplied or who is the subject of the information. Uh, somebody want to move that way? Moved, Councillor Montgomery, seconded Deputy Mayor Roach. Any discussion on moving into public excluded? All those in favour? Any against? That's carried unanimously. Good night, Jack. Thank you, welcome back. Thank you, media. Can I just get a free water break? Yes, so we're in public excluded. And okay, we'll have a recess for um, for five minutes, please, but no longer. Five minutes, please. No.